Okay. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming to this uh, as we talk about stewardship and, and this idea of a tiered approach to stewardship. Um, I am Pastor Mike Markwell here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Escanaba. Uh, I'm a first call pastor to the Synod. I've been up here since June of last year, so just approaching one year. Um, and I am the chairperson of the Stewardship Committee. And so uh, th this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And we have um, recently done a stewardship campaign, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, uh, on using this approach. Um, and th this is just one tool. We, we won't go into the great depths that uh, is about stewardship um, strategy, but we will cover a little bit of that. Um, if you guys have questions along the ways, I, I want this to be a bit of a conversation. Um, and so feel free to jump in at any point if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my information in the chat here. If you have any questions um, that come up later, feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, I'd love to be able to talk through them with you. I have a PowerPoint here. So let's go ahead and get that started. So one size fits nobody, a tiered approach to stewardship. The first thing I want to do is uh, I, I want to get a chance to kind of know who's in the room here. And so if you could get a chance, uh, if you would go ahead and um, I can't see everybody on the screen here, but just as, as, as you're available, um, unmute yourself, say who you are and what your, your affiliation is. And then if you could answer this question, other than church, what is an organization that you have given a financial donation to and why? I'll start. I'm, I'm Jane Lip from Manaqua, uh, from Ascension Lutheran Church. I'm the council president. Um, and another organization that is dear to my heart is St. Jude's. Um, and I think they do a fabulous job of communicating the message both from children and families about why that's such a critical organization and how much they have supported and helped people over the years. Thank you, Jane. I'm Pastor Brenda up in Stevenson and Wallace, and I've given to World Vision because they've snagged my heart. And so sponsoring those children have been a definitely an organization I've given financial donations to. Pastor Steve Solberg at uh, Emmanuel Nagani, uh, American Cancer Society is one of the many that I give beyond the church that uh, uh, for me, the cancer issue has been personal with my wife and with others in the family and friends. Deacon Lori Ward, Synod Missioner. I live in Norway, Michigan, and attend Calvary in Quinnipiac. And Lutheran World Relief is is one organization um, where I where I send contributions. And I know right now their relief efforts for the people of the Ukraine. One hundred percent of your donation goes to the relief effort, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Lynn DeRoche, I'm a member at Eden Lutheran in Munising. Um, Living Lands and Waters is an organization that I've donated to over the years. They're a grassroots river cleanup organization that literally hauls tons of garbage out of the Mississippi, Ohio, and other rivers, um, taking care of our environment. Well, good, thank you. I'm Pastor Jim Deering, assistant to the bishop, and I support several charities outside of the church, but I, I do give to uh, National Public Radio, our, our local uh, public radio affiliate, WNMU, because I listen often. I am a consumer and feel I should help in that effort. Chuck Thomas, uh, Northern Great Lakes Senate Vice President. 
attend First Lutheran in Gladstone. And like Pastor Jim, we give to a number of uh, charities, but the one that seems to be most needful right now that we've been donating to is Feeding America West Michigan because there's still a lot of hunger in our area. Thank you. Grant Van Lischout, uh, Marywood Spirituality Center, um, member of Ascension Lutheran in Manaqua. And um, we've given to the local wise uh, to support our youth. And we've given to the school, school districts, as well as the, our um, college alma maters. Well, I'm Pastor Bruce from Bethany and Ishpermin, and one place I do give to is Working Preacher because they're a good resource for sermon preparation. I'm okay. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just thinking, uh, I think that was about everyone, but go ahead, Rosemary. Okay. I'm Rosemary Hendricks, and I'm a member of Bethany Lutheran Church in Escanaba, and um, we give to several organizations. We go, um, you know, we mix it around a lot. We give Salvation Army, St. Vincent Paul, actually donate to the Catholic schools in their area. I'm a former Catholic and, and believe in that Christian education. And like I said, okay, I'm Pastor. Have... Oh, go ahead. Oh. I didn't, uh, I'm Rhonda McLean. I'm from Good Shepherd in Peshtigal, and I'm a member of the Peshtigal Lions Club. And every two months we volunteer for Feeding America Food Distribution from the Western Michigan organization. And I also monetarily donate to the Salvation Army throughout the year. Oh, good. And I'm Pastor Mike again. And uh, one of the organizations that my wife and I give to on a regular basis is the Chicago Food Depository. Um, we, we spent five years in Chicago and continue to support their work because we, we believe in feeding people. Um, as, as we transition here, you know, we, we kind of think of stewardship campaigns and we, we try to think of what the goals are. And so as I was working with my executive committee this spring, um, who was serving as my stewardship committee as well. Um, the goals that we came up with were we want to connect people who want to make a difference or make an impact with a way to do so. Um, as all of you shared, you know, we have different reasons why we give, but one of those is we, we want to make a difference. You know, we feel that the organization we're giving to is having a positive impact you know tongue-in-cheek we might say well it's a tax write-off which is a reason why some people might give but that's not why they choose the organization that they do um we we care about the mission of it and and the other part is that uh our our goal of our stewardship campaign was to give people the tools to increase their generosity um for some of you i know you were at the stewardship um, training that we had with Richard Weirs back in February, and, and he talked about this idea that people have a capacity to give, and then they have an actual giving level, and usually there's space there, um, and so I think one of the goals of stewardship is to help people to, uh, to close that gap a little bit and to invite them into being generous in the ways that they give. Um, Stewardship, as we understand it, is beyond financial giving. It's also time and talents. And um, we've talked about stewardship and relationships in our congregation and also stewardship of the earth. Um, this is going to, this conversation is kind of going to focus in on the financial aspect because we're talking about one element of that. And, and that is the kind of the idea of, of a stewardship letter. Just to give you a little context of, of my congregation of Emmanuel, because this is kind of a almost a case study of what we've done. Uh, we're a congregation. We worship about 60 regularly right now. Um, that's 60 in person. We probably have another 10 to 15 on any given week online. Um, our 
budget is, is is higher than that, but we have some investments and different things. We have some different ways that money comes in on that. But we have last year we in 2021 we had it was 98,000 and change. So about a hundred thousand dollars in regular giving. And of that, we had 70 households that contributed um, during our 2021 year. Uh, we work on a June fiscal year. So uh, we sent out our major stewardship campaign was here in May. Um, we sent letters out about two weeks ago and we're in the middle of a, um, well, we're wrapping up a three week sermon series on stewardship as well. And so that gives you a little context of where we come from. Um, also, we, we ran a deficit last year. So we have the same um, issue that I think a lot of our congregations are facing in the question of um, there, there's a little bit of uh, pressure to, uh, to increase our giving or reduce our bills. You know, there's, um, and so that, that's a reality of our congregation is that we're trying to close, close a deficit a little bit as well. So this approach is a, a tiered approach. And what, th what that means is that um, we sent out three different letters to the congregation. Um, and I'll discuss a little bit later about how we decided um, who got what letter. Um, but this is not an approach that I came up with, rather just something that, that I kind of stumbled across. Um, one of the resources I was exposed to in seminary was a book, Not Your Parents' Offering Plate. It is uh, written by Cliff Christopher. I'll be the first to say I don't appreciate everything he has to say in there. Um, but he did offer a couple of new approaches. And one of these was this tiered approach. Um, it really comes out of nonprofit worlds. And if you... Nonprofits are doing much better at fundraising generally than, than churches. Uh, in 1990, I think it was like 80% of charitable giving was given to churches and religious organizations. Um, since that time, the number of nonprofits, just anyone have a quick idea of how many nonprofits are registered as 501c3s in, uh, in the United States? Hundreds of thousands. Higher. Millions. Yep. There, there are over a million nonprofits registered in the United States. Um, so all, all that means is that there, there is competition out there. You know, mo most people, as we asked this question today, um, we weren't repeating things, right? We, we were giving to different organizations. And all those organizations are doing good work. And that's not to say don't give to other organizations, but as churches, we need to be good in our stewardship process. We need to be efficient in it, and we need to, we need to just not rely or hope or assume that people are going to give to us if, if we don't ask. Um, nonprofits do this great. There's an example of... Um, Universities are really good at a tiered approach. Um, I heard a story where there was a three generations of alumni from the same school in a family. And grandpa would get a letter and his letter was tiered differently. It, it asked for different things. He had been graduated for over 50 years. It was approaching, was in the last third of his life and uh, had retired and had been a faithful giver. So the letter he got uh, more frequently would ask for, you know, have you considered end of life giving? Have you uh, considered giving to a special project? Have you considered, you know, how you're remembering the university that you've supported all your life? How are you remembering them in, the, in your will? The son, his son, who had graduated 25, 30 years prior and was still working, would receive a gift that was asking about regular donations. Have you, uh, you know, thank you for your contributions. Have you considered increasing your gift this year to the school? Um, and then his daughter, who had just recently graduated, her letter looked completely different. It was asking, you know, 
would you consider a one-time donation or would you consider establishing, you know, a, a regular giving um, through your bank account or something along those lines? Uh, it was reaching out to her to establish that relationship, that pattern. Um, I work under the assumption, you know, the previous churches I had been affiliated with um, had a form letter and we sent it out to every member. Um, for those of you that are aware of your stewardship practices, how many of you is, is this kind of the standard? You send out one letter to everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a number of hands. Um, I don't think that it's, it's again, it, this isn't to say that it's, it's the worst approach ever, but there are some problems that I've experienced with it. Um, often these letters read, you know, hey, we're experiencing a budget, you know, shortfall or, or we, we need, we want to increase our budget and, and you're asking everyone to increase their giving. And one of the problems I see with this is you're asking top level givers who might be closer to the top of their capacity, you're asking them to increase their giving. Um, you're also making it seem a little impossible to people who aren't giving regularly because there's no entry into that. You know, we're, we're asking, well, you know, what do you consider? you know, a regular gift or increasing your giving. Um, this was my experience when I was first out of college. I worked for a church as a youth director. And the first couple times I got my paycheck, I figured out, you know, I'm going to be great. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give 10% of my income every single paycheck. And, you know, I, I was, I was good with that. I, I was faithful with that for about two months and then other things came up in the process and and to me it felt like it was all or nothing like oh shoot I, I can't there's you know my student loans started coming due I had my car broke down I had to buy a new car and it's like oh I'm, I'm not going to be able to give 10 percent and so I stopped giving altogether because it, it, it seemed like all or nothing um, I wish what somebody would have said at the time was you know if it's ten dollars a week if it's $20 a month, whatever that is, you know, it's okay to just start with something manageable. And the other problem with the form letters is that they can be so general that there isn't a clear ask. If you're writing a form letter and you're trying to keep the 22 year old who's just graduated from college and landed their first job in mind and the 95 year old widow, you know, there, there's not a good way to word a specific ask for both of those groups. And so this form letter, the, the goals of it are that we can reach the specific needs of people where they are financially um, and where they are in their capacity to give. Um, our hope is that we can give specific information that's important to where that donor is now. And I'll talk more about the specifics we included in our letters and that we can encourage growth in generosity based on where they currently are. If somebody hasn't given before, we asked, hey, would you consider giving a dollar a day? Um, that's a much more manageable task for somebody than, than throwing out, well, you know, even if you start with three, four, five percent of your income. Um, and to ask for specific increases. And then also we can recognize the support that they're currently giving. And the other thing that was important, I think for my congregation executive council, they asked, well, about co confidentiality of this, um, because somebody at some point has to know who is in what category of giving. Um, and, and we, we did consider that, and, and I'll talk a little bit later about the approach that we had with that. Um, this is just kind of a visual of the way we broke down our givers. So we had our, we, we considered our non-givers and people who gave less than $365 in the course of 2021's calendar year. Um, and, and we grouped those together because 
those that were under $365 for the most part, that was kind of a one-time contribution. It might've been an Easter offering. It might've been a Christmas offering. It might've been, you know, and, and that ranged from, I think, $2 to most of them were around or under $200 in the year. The middle group is our regular givers who, for the most part, you could see kind of regular giving coming in and they were, but we excluded the top 10 to 20% of that. Um, and the hope is, is that we can move people along this line from left to right over years. Um, we're we're going to take the same approach. The, the content of the letters will change year over year, but our hope is that next year, um, success of this stewardship campaign will be next year when I look at our total givers, that we have a lot of people who are right around $365, who previously had given less than that, because our ask was, you know, 300 to consider a dollar a day. And then for our top givers, the ask we, we put in the letters there was to consider legacy giving, to consider considering us in our will. We were lucky enough this last year, we benefited from a member who had passed, who had considered the church in their will. They had left 10% of their, their final estate to the congregation. And that was a very wonderful gift for our congregation to receive. Um, special projects, we've finished up, a, well, we're working on a kitchen remodel. But we found out that, you know, we might need some major roof repairs coming up. So um, we didn't put the specifics of those projects in, but we just asked people to consider them. And then challenge gifts. Last year in their campaign, they did a little bit more of this, but they had somebody who offered a matching up to a certain point, or they said if 50 families gave a pledge, then they would give $500 towards our kitchen remodel. Um, I'll show you guys a copy of the letters eventually here, but this is just kind of the basics of it. So for our non-givers or our irregular givers, those under $365, we thanked them for being part of the ministry. Um, you know, they had all, all given at some level or they are on our books as members. Some of them have been active in serving in different ways. And so this letter, we thanked them for that. We highlighted the ministries that were made possible. Um, these are things that I'm assuming are in most of your form letters. Yes, Cindy. Uh, Pastor Mike, I'm, I got in a little late. The $365, is that um, a month, a year, or what? No, that, that's a year. So, so our first category of givers, when we broke down our list, was people who had given under $365 in the oh, yeah. calendar year prior. So in 2021. Okay. Yep. Great Thank question. You. Thank you. And so we invited them to give a dollar a day. And we, we just kind of chose that because it's a very, it, it seems achievable. And the hope is that we'll encourage regular giving. Um, in our letter, we said, if you want to start higher than a dollar a day, you know, Pick a number, $2, $3, $4 a day, whatever seems comfortable for or seems appropriate for you. But we didn't want to push people off with too big of an ask because these are people who haven't con contributed in regular or, or in, in larger ways in the past. And the goal with this is we, we want to build, we want to build that habit. And I think. All of us know that, you know, giving to the church, um, generosity to any organization ju just doesn't happen overnight. You don't go from being a, a non-giver to, um, you know, giving $10,000 a year annually. It usually doesn't happen. It's something that's built over time. And we want them to feel invested in the ministry. They're an important part of the ministry, and we, we, we don't want to make them feel like, oh, you haven't given, you're not a part of it. You, you are. We're inviting you to participate in this different way. The second letter, this group, we went from $365 to less than 200 or $2,400 in a year. Um, and those numbers were what worked for us 
um, just the way it broke down. Really, I don't think anyone had given kind of in that. I think that our lowest giving household in this was actually like five hundred dollars. Um, we didn't really have anyone in that category between three sixty five and five hundred, but. Um, we chose about 200, 2,400, uh, that would be 200 bucks a month. And, and, and people that are above that we would, were our top 20%. So this is, this is regular givers. Um, for the most part, these are people who are turning in envelopes on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, um, consistent in giving, but are under our kind of top 20% givers. And here are at, again, we thank them for their support. We encourage them to start giving based on a percentage of their income if they haven't already. And then if they are giving on a percentage of their income, we invited them to increase their percent um, by 1%. So um, my wife and I were about 7% last year and we we decided to make a jump to 9%, right? But, but the ask would have been to go from 7% to 8%. Um, and the goals here is, to build trust that their giving is to good use. Yeah, this is the largest chunk of, of giving actually for us. Um, and we want to make sure that people are confident that their gifts are going to the, the mission of the church. And so we built up kind of the things that we have done and we want to establish a repeatable pattern for giving growth. Um, that 1% increase is something that hopefully families, households will be able to do over time. They'll be able to continue to increase 1%. Um, I knew a story of a woman who they started doing this and uh, she got to like 45%. And uh, just every year she was giving one more percent, one more percent, one more percent. And over the course of 35, 40 years, she got up to 45% of, of her income. Um, Obviously, you know, that's the extreme. That's, that's, that's a wonderful generosity. Um, that's not something I think that, you know, we should expect of everyone, but to take that small step year over year. And then our last, our, our top level givers, the, those top 20%, who for us were giving $2,400 or more. Um, we thank them for their generosity and their continued support, and we ask them to consider special projects, challenge gifts, or legacy giving. Um, and then we are going to back that up by having somebody from Thriving come in either this summer or early in the fall to talk about different ways to establish some of those things. And uh, there we want to show our appreciation for the generosity and we want to plant the seeds for special giving. Well, pause there. Are there any questions before we dive into the actual content of the letters? It's hard to find new things to say. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just saying it's hard to find new things to, to say in a letter, but our stewardship person does a really good job. Yeah, and, and I think that that's, that's, that's always the challenge, right? How do you not just send out the same letter you sent last year, right? I was wondering if you have strategies to increase the engagement of people in your ministries um, who, who might be on the lower end of the, the giving scale, just to get them more involved and more interested. Yeah, um, that's a great question. We haven't focused too much on, on time and talents. I, I did do a three-part sermon series on that, and we talked a little bit more about that um, in, in the sermons and different ways to get engaged. The other thing we're just trying to do in general good practice of the church is to increase the opportunities people have to serve. So one thing we're doing, um, Escanaba, the community the church is in has a city cleanup day you know just a clean up the park type of thing um on may 21st and so we have a sign up sheet going and we have people who are signing up to to participate with that um that's not something we've done in the past that's you know that that's not something we'd necessarily think about too much but 
it's an opportunity for people. It's a Saturday, you know, most of our church functions are midweek. We're hoping to reach a different level of people to, to get involved in a project like that. Um, you know, we, we're, we're not perfect at it, Lori. All right. Like there's, there's definitely room for us to grow there. Um, I, I haven't put too much of an ask for committees. You know, our, our committee structure is starting to get a little bit, bit stronger after COVID. Um, part of that too is, you know, things had been stripped down a little bit. Mark, I see you got a hand up. Yeah, I've got a question. I, I came in a little bit late. I'm sorry about that, but I missed the first part. When you describe your three groups, uh, uh, from what I heard when I did arrive, it sounds like the, the, the cutoff was maybe sort of based upon a sense of your congregation and how the giving of, of your congregation divided up sort of into the, the, the lower, the middle, and the upper. No. Is that roughly the, the, the way you decided on the three different letters? Uh, or was there some other thinking involved in that? I'm sorry if you have to repeat yourself. I just, I missed that part. No, no, that's okay. That's actually our next slide here. And so we're kind of covering it back. Um, we had, I, I had looked at it and we had a lot of givers who were under that 365. And, and that a dollar a day was something I had heard once. Um, and, and I, my wife and I, we, we give a dollar a day to a missionary who I went to college with. And, you know, it's not something, it's not a primary support of ours, but you know, it's, it's $33 a month because we cover the 10% convenience fee or whatever, but, um, it, it's just something that's, that's very achievable. And we started doing that back when we were in or I was in seminary still and, and things were a little tighter, but we could still make a dollar a day happen. And so my first goal is, is I want, I really want to bring everybody who gives up to $365. Um, I, I think that that's pretty achievable. Um, I crunched the numbers for our own congregation. You can see there, we have 16 non-giving households. Um, I think Firing from the hip, I don't have it in front of me. It's like $6,000 we would increase in giving if we had those households um, become, start giving a dollar a day. All right, in one year we would see that increase. Um, and, and of the other households, the difference between what they are giving to that, it would be like another $4,000. So we'd make up $10,000 in a year if, if we did that. So, so that was kind of that ask first. Um, then the second category, exactly. I, I knew that we wanted to send something kind of to the top givers, 240 or yeah, $2,400 was just a good break for us. Um, we had a lot of households that were around there. I did move some people from one category to another, kind of use some pastoral discretion. If they, you know, if you knew that a life situation or something going on, you know, you might say, okay, they, they haven't given regularly here, but but we want to include them here. And, and so I, we, we did look through those numbers a little bit. Um, confidentiality is an important part with this. I, I didn't share these lists widely with anyone. The only people that see the giving are myself and our financial secretary. And so even the executive committee who helped me form these letters, they didn't know who was going to receive what at the end of the day. Okay. Lane, uh, Mark, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, except you gave me a follow-up, which I, I'll, I'll make quick. So um, your committee helped to draft the letters, but they really didn't know, did they know the dollar values of the three groups? Um, I think they knew the dollar values of the three groups. Um, if I didn't tell them that, it, it wasn't intentional in not telling them that. I think we, we did discuss about where we were gonna end up. Um, but they didn't know who received the three letters. So, you know, I stuffed them myself. Uh, you know, it, it took me maybe an hour and a half, two hours to, to do it. Um, but I, I wanted that to stay with 
one person um, because I didn't want, you know, I, I do want to respect people's privacy and, you know, you can start to figure things out if, if you know who's getting what letters necessarily. So. Right, right. Thank you. Yep. Lynn, I see you got a hand up. Yeah. Did you have any consideration or discussion that there may be people who are already stretched at their current level of giving um, in terms of your asking for an increase? Yeah, well, we, we did consider that. Um, I, I feel that there, there's usually a little bit of, of a gap between people's capacity to give and their giving. And so I think as is with any stewardship letter, you know, you, you, you make the ask, but you're also willing to hear the answer no. Um, you know, we asked for people to give an increase and if they don't, you know, we're, we, we didn't ask for pledges this year in that. Um, and, and that was a personal decision that our committee made. We sent out a card that um, asks them to write a goal for their own accountability, but they're not bringing that into the church. Um, you know, I, I understand that some people are probably at, at their limit and that's a decision they can make. Um, part of my goal with these letters, I had a couple people read through them for this specifically, was to not make people feel guilty. Um, we didn't mention, as I mentioned, you know, we're transparent about it, that we're, we're running a bit of a budget deficit. Um, we didn't mention that in our stewardship letter. This wasn't a, hey, we need more money, otherwise we're not going to be able to pay for X, Y, Z. Um, th th this was a letter that, that encouraged generosity based on the good things that we were able to provide. Um, but, you know, that's something you got to figure out in your own context, too. Maybe you have to add a add a fourth letter or you take some of those people who are at their capacity and say even if they're not top 10 percent top 20 percent givers maybe we send them that letter because we know they can't increase their capacity over their regular giving right now does that make sense Lynn yeah thank you yep you're welcome Any other questions at this point? <laughs> I always have questions, uh, Mike, um, Pastor Mike. I, I, I guess, again, I missed the very introduction of your talk. So if I'm asking something that I don't want to bore everybody else with repeat information, but um, I mean, the, I think there's philosophical issues that underlay a lot of this that are very difficult to wrestle with. You know, when you talk about confidentiality, you sort of hit on, on, on something that, that's sort of a philosophical question. And, and that is, and, and sort of the, th the different layers also hits on this, which is who is it to decide what's an appropriate gift between to your church between you and God, is there anybody who can even advise on that? And if so, how how do you advise on it? Obviously, you're taking the bull by the horns and saying yes. Uh, it is it is something that's very personal between you and God, but but we're going to help guide you a little bit by giving these different levels of of information and response in the in the guidance. Um, I mean, I, I guess it's just a tough question because, you know, I mean, uh, there's sort of all these uh, unspoken things that you mentioned guilt. Well, you know, are we playing on guilt? If we give the congregation information that, hey, we're in a deficit, that may make some people feel guilty, but maybe on the other hand, it's important for them to know that from a, a responsibility and a stewardship point of view, so that at least there's no surprise later on when the congregation finds out that, gee, we, we, we've depleted uh, our church's savings from the last 40 years of savings because we've been a deficit for the last five years or whatever. We don't wanna surprise anybody with that kind of information. So maybe it's important to tell that. I mean, there's just so many things that are tied into this 
and I, I'm not even sure where to start with all these questions that I have about this. So please forgive me for going on and maybe you can address whatever that you feel comfortable with. No, uh, Mark, I think it's a great question. And uh, I, I think that it is. And I've talked with some of my colleagues about it. And, it, and it, I think it's a, a question of, you know, is this even the right approach for your congregation, right? This, this is a tool. Um, maybe you don't feel that sending out tiered letters is best. Um, I'm sure that at some level, you are making some sort of suggestion or ask on stewardship. Um, if, if we aren't putting any tools into people's hands about what appropriate giving is. I told this story in my sermon the other week. Um, I had been at a meeting with Richard Weirs, who is the, um, he's the regional coordinator for the ELCA investment fund for, for our region. And he had told a story of a young man who had started working for an oil company as an engineer out in North or South Dakota. I can't remember which. And he really didn't have much of a church background, got involved with the church, wanted to become a member, joined. And the extent of stewardship conversation with him was somebody handed him a box of letter or a box of envelopes the day he joined the congregation. And so he had no idea what was appropriate to give to the church. He had no guidance on it. And so he sat at home and thought, well, you know what, a a, um, a movie is kind of like church. Going to see a movie is kind of like going to church. And I spend $15 when I go to the movies. Maybe I should spend $15 when I go to church. And then the uh, then he thought about it and said, well, you know what? A movie's two hours and a church is an hour. So maybe I should spend $7.50 <laughs> when I go to church. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's funny but at the same time, that, that man had a lot more capacity to give. And, and he did realize that eventually when he saw the numbers of the congregation and thought, oh boy, I, I, I really have an opportunity to be a lot more generous here. Um, and, and I understand not wanting to tell people what they can give. Um, so we always put it in the form of, of an ask. And, and again, you know, people can say, no, that's not going to work for me. But um, if you don't give some suggestion, you know, people are left to their own devices. You know, I, I don't think that we have, have a culture where people just know what is appropriate to give to the church. It, it, ultimately it's between them and God. I agree with you on that. We're just trying to help direct that conversation a little bit and give them tools to answer that question. That's good. I appreciate that. I, and I wasn't trying to be critical. I just, I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, sort of like, well, uh, is the expectation 10% of your income, that's what the Bible says. And and then you get into all these questions about, yes, but 10% uh, is an awful lot. And oh, by the way, I have to give taxes and state taxes and uh, income taxes and, and, and blah, blah, blah. And so, I mean, it gets complicated quickly in terms of, of any kind of rational way to deal with it. Uh, you know, maybe having a conversation on a private level is one thing, but doing it in a letter is, it's like, who are you going to offend the most and who are you going to offend the least? Because there's going to be some generalization in the letter that doesn't actually fit everybody that gets the letter, no matter whether there's three letters or one letter or 10 letters. Uh, so it's a complicated thing, I, I think, that I, I don't feel like I have the answers to, but I think you're on the right track by at least trying to uh, address different segments of your congregation from where they're coming from and, and, and you know, doing that based upon information of what they're actually giving. Uh, again, the confidentiality thing is real important, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I know that it's a big sensitivity area that you know, people don't want other people to know what they're giving or not giving. Yeah, and, and I would say it's, it's you know, you had mentioned philosophical questions. I, I think it's a philosophical question based on your context, if the pastor should even know whether or not, know what people's giving is. Um, we had a culture here where, where it wasn't much of an issue. I, I had asked, and I feel that, you know, it, it's just an element of, um, it's almost a pastoral care thing as well, because 
if I see somebody's giving drops suddenly, um, you know, there might be something going on where that's an opportunity to have a conversation, um, not in the guilt filled way, but, you know, if someone's regular and they're giving and all of a sudden it drops off, um, there might be something going on there that they're not, that they're waiting to, to have somebody ask about, hey, what, what's going on? Is, is everything okay? Um, so I, I would say at most, um, you know, if you have a, somebody's entering your information into your recording software, they already see this, right? And so that person could send out the letters and, and that's who I had to compile that information for me. Um, but I, I wouldn't even put this on a stewardship committee because I, I think that the less people that know the better. All right, I'm gonna move on here because I want to just give you an idea of, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna pull up the letters that we actually sent out. So this is our, our form letter for, these are the, this is the people who were giving $365 or less. Um, and as you can see, we, I, I, I hit with that language a dollar a day right off the bat. Um, a dollar a day provides our children with opportunities to learn about God in unique and safe environment. We talk about our children's ministry that we just launched on Friday nights. Um, tell a little bit of a story of, of how one of our kids was able to rearticulate that theme back to their parents. Um, a dollar a day, we talk about our buildings and grounds. That's a big part of our budget, so it seems silly not to mention it, but how we're able to use that beyond just Sunday morning. Um, you know, Hope at the Inn is a seasonal um, homeless shelter that runs here in Delta County, and we were able to, to provide housing to um, people experiencing homelessness and that particular leak, it was minus 15, right? So we put that number in there. Um, I, I think it kind of shows a way that we were able to meet a need. Um, we talk a little bit about worship. Again, we're talking about things that contributing to the budget, contributing to the church helps us provide. Um, as is with most stewardship letters, I, I included a story here. This, I, I went with the story of the feeding of the 5,000 just because I, I think that for the boy, uh, that seems like such a small thing. He knew that his little contribution wasn't going to um, be able to feed everyone. And I think that, uh, you know, you know, a dollar a day isn't going to fund the church, right? Like, like you're not going to pay for, um, you know, your music licensing and you're not going to pay for your staff and you're not going to pay for your building on a dollar a day, but yet again, we can, because that's the, that's the amazing things that God can do through that. Um, that, that it's just, it is a part of that. Um, so we told that story. And then here, th this is really the part that gets very specific to this group. And so this, these last two paragraphs, like, this is where the ask is, you know, if you can't give a dollar, or if you can give more than a dollar, whether it's two, three, four, or five dollars, we invite you to do so. Um, maybe I'm a little insensitive here. I, I don't really, I, I didn't leave too much room if, if a dollar was more than you could give. There might be a couple of people in your congregations that fall into that situation. Um, I could have worded it maybe a little differently. I didn't though. Um, and then we gave here, this is the only letter we put our online giving information in and we don't have a strong online giving percentage. We have, I think two households do it on a regular basis. Um, but the reason we included it in this letter is because we are looking to build a habit. And for people who haven't given regularly in the past, um, having it out of sight, out of mind might be a better way to do it. I didn't include it in the top, in the higher letters, because we do lose, what, 2%, 3%, I can't remember the exact number, through our online giving. And so, you know, we really don't want our people who are contributing $5,000 a year to lose that percentage off of it. And so, and, and they've got an established habit. But here, I thought it was important to include that. And so, so we have that in there. 
The second and the third letter are very similar. We tell the same stories. Um, I didn't put in the dollar a day quest. Uh, Cindy, I see you got a question. Yeah, um, just wondering, we have a lot of snowbirds and I, I personally haven't asked them and don't know financially, but um, I'm guessing they split their they're giving between their two churches if they have a steady church like in Florida or something. Does anyone else have that issue or situation? Um, and that will make a difference if there's a lot of snowbirds, if you have a lot of snowbirds, I think. So it's just a comment that we've, over the years, we've had to really take that into consideration budget-wise. Yeah, I think you know, up here, that's definitely a thing. We we have some, and then we have some that I would say are summer people up here, and that their primary church, their primary residence is elsewhere, and and so um, they they might not even officially be members here, but might be on the regular giving rolls in that way. Mark, yeah, um, and and maybe Chuck is going to address this. I think there's something in the. The constitution, uh, the model constitution about, uh, you know, your membership and, and dual membership or, or having multiple memberships and, and splitting your giving isn't, isn't actually addressed, I don't think, in the constitution. But, but obviously, there are going to be people who, who are in two congregations. I suppose there might even be some who are in three. I don't know. But um, it, I, I think that going to be such a unique question you know how much time do they spend in one place or another do they divide it 50 50 do they divide it based upon time you know 40 60 whatever there's so many ways to look at that uh i i don't know that you could address that in a letter other than to bring up the subject that if you are you know dual membership please consider you know giving some to both congregations in dividing your support in some manner, not just giving it all to one and just assuming that because you're giving it all to one, you can go to whatever church you want and, and they don't need any contributions. Yeah, I, I think that that's, you know, I, I haven't, I really didn't put too much thought into it other than I can say, um, off the top of my head, knowing our givings, um, our snowboard birds exclusively fall into the second or third category, right? None, none of them were under three hundred and sixty-five dollars. Um, Chuck, you're muted, Chuck. There we go. I'm unmuted now. Sorry. <laughs> um, our congregation many many years ago started pushing automatic giving. We used something called simply giving back then. Of course, that's morphed into something else now. But And one of the reasons why we pushed that, it was the issue of snowbirds. Um, we were seeing that while they were faithful members of our congregation and faithful givers, uh, during that period of time when they weren't there, they weren't giving their envelopes into church, you know, because they went back when you, everybody used envelopes. So we really pushed hard on the um, automatic giving through bank account withdrawal. And that really helped us at a time when our, when we were seeing some budget stress and moving forward. We have a, I believe, I can't give you the exact numbers because I'm not on the stewardship committee, but I know from talking to folks that we have a significant percentage of our congregation that does do regular giving through that uh, automatic withdrawal from the account. And it's very helpful for budgeting purposes too every year to have that steady uh, steady known amount. Uh, you're right, Chuck. And, and the, the numbers, the research out there backs it up. Um, our congregation just, it, it hasn't, they pushed it. It didn't really catch on. So rather than continue to push something that's been, you know, put the energy in where it hasn't kind of produced in the past though we made this decision not to, to emphasize it but again that's just to show that this is this is contextual right stewardship is all about knowing knowing the patterns of your people and your community um, 
but but good point on that. So I just want to address the second and third letter. Again, the content's the same. And really, the only thing that differed in the second and third letter was because it's it's very much thankful language. Thank you for everything you're doing is when we get down to the bottom here. And so, <coughs> excuse me. And the second letter here, this is where we ask for the, if you um, would consider giving on a percentage and then giving, you know, increasing that. And, and the examples I gave here were kind of intentional on the lower end below 10%, just to kind of affirm that that's okay, right? Like if you're giving 3%, increase it to four or five from six. Those were the examples. I purposefully didn't choose, you know, 11 to 12%. I don't want people to think that's where they have to be. Um, in my sermon on Sunday, I said, tithing is a great thing to strive for, but if you never get there, that's okay. You know, the 10% is a great thing to strive for, but if you never get there, that that's okay. You know, um, we, we, we don't, I think, as was mentioned earlier, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of money. And I think to get people to think they have to jump there or be there, um, I don't think it's constructive. That's just kind of my opinion on it. And then this, this last version again. So when we get down to that um, last portion, we're asking about um, considering estate planning, end of life giving, um, additional gifts towards special projects. We are at 1.55, so Eastern time. So I'll just take questions at this point. I won't share anything new with you guys, but if, you, if anyone has additional questions, um, if you've got a run, I respect that too. Um, like I said, my email and everything should be in the chat um, and my phone number. If not, you can look me up on the Synod directory um, or just call me at the church office here at Emmanuel and I'll get back to you. But um, um, I appreciate your willingness. I, I did a little more talking than I, I wanted to. I was hoping to have a little more conversation, but a lot of information out there. Um, as you enter into your stewardship campaigns, if, if you have questions, if you do an annual campaign November time, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, like I said, I don't know everything, but uh, I, I'm willing to talk through things with you. Any other questions? I was wondering... Uh... I think the letters are are uh, are uh, wonderfully written, but I was wondering if you gave, gave any thought to the length of them. My understanding that uh, uh, people we send letters to have a much shorter attention span. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I I do think that people didn't read them. Uh, as I mentioned, we had pledge cards that were meant to be stay at home. I, I think somebody just opened one up and saw the card and filled it out and dropped it in the offering um, or in the uh, offering plate on Sunday because I did get one back. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's always something to consider is how, how far do people read down a letter? Um, it was good information. I wanted to put it in there. You know, I question the same thing when I write newsletter articles too, right? How, how long do people read? Um, it's something we have to ask. And also, I think that that's just to prove that, you know, stewardship letters should not be the only stewardship we're doing, right? We should be reaching people in other ways as well, whether that's, um, we've started putting it, uh, we live stream our service, and I've started putting the link for our online giving just in the blurb, like, when we start the live stream, so people can click on it, they get redirected to the website, it's right there, you know, that's just another way to do it. Um, Pastor Mike, you referred to um, a three sermon um, emphasis on yes. stewardship. Can you um, just highlight maybe some of the main tenets that you were sure to cover? Um, did you, you know, were they three different, real different topics or were they connected or, but you had referred to that a couple of times. I was curious about those sermons. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. They were... On the theme of generosity, the first one we used, uh, Genesis 1, was the text. And we just talked about how the, the topic of, or the, the title of the sermon was, um, we are invited to be generous with God's creation. And uh, I talked a lot about uh, environmentalism in that, too. Uh, it was right after Arbor Day, so it kind of fit with that a little bit. But just this idea of 
in our time and in our resources too, you know, we're invited to be generous with the things that God has given us. Um, okay. The second letter or the second um, sermon this last week was on how generosity looks different. Um, the sermon te- or the text, the gospel text was the story of the widow with her two mites and how generosity for her was two copper coins. Um, the, the, gener- the generosity is not $10,000. Um, generosity is, is your capacity to give and where your heart is in it. Um, and that there's kind of no, no specific dollar amount. And that's why I said, you know, even 10%, you know, you hear it a lot, but that, that, that is not the key to generosity is not 10%. Um, Mm -hmm. and then the sermon that I'm going to give on Sunday is the feeding of the 5,000 and it'll kind of wrap it up of how we sometimes, not always, but sometimes get to see the, wonderful things God can do with our generosity. And I'm using the John version of that, where the boy is the one who brings forward the the two fish and the five loaves and how he's able to see the rewards of his generosity. Um, We have a beautiful baptism happening that day. It's a sixth generation member of our congregation. I'm going to tie that into, right? That is, that is the fruits of a century's worth of stewardship in many ways that, that we're getting able we're going to be able to see that so that that was mm-hmm. where the, mm-hmm. the sermons went. thank you thank you're you. welcome pastor mike i, I just want to say it, thank you obviously for this workshop in in obviously you are modeling what what i think is so wonderful and powerful when a pastor takes a leadership role in stewardship, takes an interest, a lot of intent. The team, uh, the pastor doesn't have to do everything, but my, oh my, it seems pretty obvious to me. I've, anecdotally it's certainly when pastors take an interest in stewardship matters in intentional ways and thoughtful ways then uh, all kinds of generosity uh, gets uh, gets created and it's part of our faith it's not dirty it's not it's not filthy dirty stuff to talk about money it is cold grace and gospel and uh thank you you're welcome and th- thank you for those kind words i'm gonna stop the screen share. one other thing i was gonna say pastor mike i think you did a good job in the letters of trying to communicate to everyone what you are doing you know i think there are a lot of people who may have an idea of what all the church is doing in terms of providing service, but they don't have specific information about it. And I think you tried to do that. And I think that's something that we learned in the schools also when the budgets were really tight and we counted on contributions from either parents or grandparents or whatever, either for technology or you know science equipment or anything. They really liked us going online and putting specifically the initiatives and what we needed the financing for. And many of them came back and said, we really appreciated having that information. We're happy to donate for this initiative. We now understand what you're trying to do. You gave specific information. So, you know, I think we can learn a lot from each other with regards to that schools, churches, as you said, nonprofits. But I learned something from doing that and making sure it was on our website, making sure people knew where the need was and what specifically their funding or or gift would go for. Well, good. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Chris? Yes. I just had a thought when you were talking about um, special projects and things like that. I I believe that in many of our, especially our smaller congregations, we have people who don't really grasp the full, you know, what the the 
the money is for, or they say, yeah, well, okay, that the budget takes care of that. But they really, really react when there is a specific something needed. And uh, uh, they're likely to jump on that one. And mm -hmm. I think this is a, a thing about not only knowing what the giving level is of your people. I, I heard a story once about um, it was a, a pastor who uh, noticed that um, that suddenly a member a member's giving had not dropped, but gone kind of sky high. And he thought, oh, well, he must have inherited something or whatever. Well, this kept going for several weeks. So he finally went to the man and said, hey, I noticed your your, your giving really uh, made quite a jump. Uh, what's happened? And the man said, well, pastor, I've been listening to you for about seven years, and I finally got it. So it has a lot to do with the spirituality of our people, too. And I can't remember. It was a, it was, I'm thinking it may have been um, Cal Kelwaite who told that story, but it, I'm not I'm not positive about that. The point is, it's a real story and it's stuck in my mind. And so I'm thinking, knowing not only what people give, but knowing enough about them to know who's likely to respond to a particular need uh, or a particular, uh, something the church earnestly desires to do, like extra, um, uh, money for camping scholarships, you know, where you know your congregation well enough to know what the needs are, and then put those out, you know, in the weekly bulletin, in the new monthly newsletter, or highlight maybe one of those in an occasional letter. But, and I also wanted to react to the, the question about the length of the letter. That was the thing that struck me, that if I got a letter like that, it would be like, oh, I'll read that later. No, no offense, but that's what my reaction would be just because there's just so much going on. Um, maybe a, a little shorter and a different structure, or maybe a, if you're interested, uh, attached is a list of the, the things that we're putting, uh, that we earnestly desire to do or we're doing right now, rather than putting it all in the letter. Attachments give people an opportunity to peruse later while still getting the heart of what you're after. Um, in your in your letters, but I, I I found this very valuable. I'm now on a, a stewardship committee, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll learn something before the meeting next week. So thank you. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad it took something out of it. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's you know length. When we'll see. You know, the the good thing about this is I'm going to be able to have. Um, specific ways to measure the success of this campaign, right? So mm. uh, next year, I'm going to look at and see how many people were probably between 300 and 400 dollars, right? Like, and, and to see, you know, did people respond to this? And if, if it completely failed, then I'll give a lesson next year on what we learned wrong or, or what we learned that went wrong, right? And uh, I definitely think that's part of it. Am I breaking up on you guys? I'm sorry. You were you say, just yeah. just say again what you said that we missed. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, it's telling me my internet's unstable. I uh, was just saying we'll be able to evaluate this program, right? So there are very specific things we're asking from specific people. I can track that. Um, our financial secretary can track that. We will see who responded and how this how how this letter chain was received. It was a good presentation, Pastor. Well, thank you. You know, and I've never been on a stewardship committee, I admit, but I have been on church council, and it never once occurred to me to have a different letter for different age groups. I think that's really good thinking, especially if you've got some, like, you know, young people in their early 20s compared to someone who's been giving and going to church for 50 years. Yeah, it's a big gap. They need different letters. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, we didn't even divide by age, but it's definitely something you, I kind of considered as I moved some people from one to the other, um, you know, depending on where they were in retirement and such, but there's all sorts of ways you, you can make a decision on how you want to divide this. Stuff. To customize it more, I think, yeah. Another thought that occurs to me is when you, uh, you say you, you 
hands on each letter, which I think is wonderful. Something that you might know about the person, you know, like they're, they've just graduated college and they've got a new job, a little note that says, congratulations, we sure wish you the best. You know, something, a little personal handwritten addendum on the letter. That's a lot of work, but I think it's <laughs> worth it. That's a, it's a good idea though. I, I definitely think um, one thing I had heard kind of along those lines is that once a year, the pastor should write something on the quarterly reports if they go out, you know, should, should just write a little note on each of them. Just let people know that, you know, hey, we, we appreciate what you're doing and, and, and see this as part of your life. I think on the letters, if you could include maybe what's going on or what has happened in a few bullet points because when people can glance at something and gather the information then they don't have to necessarily read the whole thing but they can just kind of glance and grab it yeah uh, bruce as you know i'm a storyteller as uh this session has gone an hour and 10 minutes now but you know uh i, I don't do too many things very concise but it's definitely a place we have to grow and just, you know, the dollar a day thing, I've been hearing that on like for Christian radio stations or whatever for years. And that's, they've really hit that pretty hard. Thanks again, Pastor Mike. And uh, Pastor Mike was thrust into the leadership of our Synod Stewardship Committee and he has taken the bull by the yeah, horns. Yeah, yay. He, he, I, I really appreciate Mike. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, uh, I'll copy my information down here. If anyone wants to get a hold of me or follow up with anything, I'm more than willing to do that. And if you really love stewardship, um, contact me and we'll, we'll get you on the committee. And Pastor Jim, I think we have some spaces we can, uh, we can put some people on. So We love people on stewardship committee. All right. Join Thanks. the fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much Thanks for, uh, for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you.